Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Yeah. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Sing it out, Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi fight your battle. Oh, oh, oh. Jehovah Nisi fight your battle. Oh, Lord. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Yeah. Jehovah Nisi fight. Jehovah Nisi fight. Jehovah Nisi fight your battle. God is great. Our God is so great. Great are you, Lord. You are so great. Great Jehovah. Great Jehovah. You are, you are, you are. Great Jehovah. We pour out our praise to you this morning. Praise to you this morning. We give you our hearts, God. For you worthy, 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 Lord. Oh. You give 
word this morning. You've been the prophet. 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 Yes. 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 Believe it, get excited, get excited, get excited. This is your opportunity. Prophesy that this is the move. This is the move. This morning, right now, right here, this is the move. Come on, open your mouth and declare it. This is the move. This is the move. It's my day of miracles. It's my time of miracles. This is the move. This is the move. This is the move. Yes, Jesus. Can I just encourage you to just lift up your hands to the Lord this morning and you begin to talk to Him about the area of your life where you need a miracle. Begin to talk to Him. Please don't give up. You may have been asking for a while and it looks like it hasn't happened yet. But come on, just pray about it again this morning. Pray about it again this morning. Tell Him, Lord. I need a miracle. I know legs that need to be healed. Legs that need to be healed. I'm crying out to the Lord on behalf of one of my sisters and I'm saying, oh God, oh God, we've been trusting you for this miracle. Lord, this is the move. This is the time. Now is the hour. Come on, go ahead, pray for your miracle. Pray for your miracle. Surade sataya. Come on, Jesus. Yes, Lord. 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 happen without any outward manifestation from time to time when I'm praying for people in altar ministry I get caught up with the person who gets a touch from the Lord and loses their balance and fall backwards but from time to time the Spirit of the Lord will remind me Daniel is not about that don't look for that I, I know the ministers know what I'm talking about. Sometimes when, when you're kind of praying on the altar and, and this one drops and that one drops and then the next one you pray for uh, because they're not dropping, subconsciously you're thinking they didn't get it yet, they didn't receive something yet. But it's not about the outward manifestation. The Lord God Almighty is spirit. His operation starts in the spirit realm. It doesn't have to have a physical manifestation for it to be done. I mean, let me give you an example. A centurion comes and talks about his servant and said, my servant is dying. 
is I don't know how many miles away from where the servant is but in another geographical spot Jesus says to him you go back your servant is healed now I can tell that what the servant probably needed was a miracle because you don't run around looking for help if somebody was just sick it must have been a sickness unto death now right where the centurion was there was nothing in the physical to show him that something has happened to the servant. Jesus speaks a word. It's like Jesus saying, I said, miracles happen when I speak and heaven is coming in your house. I mean, Jesus just spoke a word. And the Bible said, as he was going home, he was met on the way. And he asked and they said, at this very same hour, your servant was healed. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but somebody needs to just open up their hands before the Lord and open up your heart one more time. And just begin to tell the Lord, it's this time, Lord. You may have prayed about the situation 150 times, but this one more, one more time, this time, this time, this time, this time. This time, this time, this time. Come on, somebody pray to it. Pray to it. It may be something in your personal life. It may be something in the life of your loved one. Like my heart this morning, I'm crying out for a particular daughter of the house, a particular sister that I'm saying, oh God, don't let her lose hope. Don't let her lose hope. Oh God, let this day be the day of our healing. Let this be the time of the deliverance. Let it be now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. Set our hearts on you. Come and do what you do. We're here for you. We are here. time we're here for you we are here for I welcome you angels of the Lord this morning come and do what you've been sent by the Father to do feel the truth and touch the sons and the daughters of God
sit if you can. open up your hands like there's an invisible messenger FedEx from heaven just coming down to your row coming down the aisle to drop something in your hands Prophet on, I really just sense in the morning, this morning that we're just to keep this flow. We're just to keep this flow. But I just feel like I need to encourage somebody this morning, don't permit any distraction. You're here for an appointment with the Lord. The interesting thing is we are in the season of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we are trusting God for a visitation from the Lord. And we have an authentic prophet in the house. Because we're living in a time now where a lot of people just kind of flow in gifts of word of knowledge or gifts of prophecy. And they, they print cards and call themselves prophets. A prophet is not just a man who can give or a woman who can give a prophetic word. It's an office. If we consider just the word Nabi alone, that word says that a true prophet, a Nabi prophet, is a spokesman for God. Now that's different from, I'm just giving you a prophetic word. I, I can hold people's hands and I can pray prophetically and I can pray words of knowledge. But I don't go around saying I'm a prophet. It's not just being able to have a download and release a download, but the unique things about the prophet is when they declare the word of the Lord, it's with the same power as if it's God speaking. Do you know what it is to be a spokesman? To be a spokesman is completely different from being a newscaster. It's different from being a courier. Spokesman is, you've been delegated the authority to speak in the stead of the other person. So I'm saying this this morning because I want you to prepare your heart. All true today, I believe we're going to receive the ministry of God's prophet. And so I'm praying into it and I'm saying, Father, we thank you. No interruptions, no obstructions. We bind every satanic and demonic force, a sign formed fashion, wherever it may come from, we say it will not prosper this morning. Lord, I even come against the spirit of religion. And sometimes the religious theatricals, that may look spiritual to the one who is not discerning but it's actually just meant to break other people's focus none of that today we're going to receive the word from the lord is there anybody who will receive the word just lift up your right hand and just say lord i'm ready to receive your word i'm ready to receive your word i'm ready to receive your word ready to receive your word thank you Jesus I don't know I keep hearing this in my spirit and I'm just going to release it as I'm about to bring the prophet on 
May we never lose our wonder. 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 Care for mind, we must never take for granted what God is doing in our midst. It's not coming. Wide-eyed and mystified. May we be just like a child, staring at the beauty of our King. Wide eyed and mystified, may we be just like a child, staring at the beauty of our King. May we never lose our wonder. 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 May we never lose our One more time, wide eye. That's what we pray for today. Why die, why die, and mystify? May we be just like a child, staring at the beauty of our King. Why die? You're beautiful. You are beautiful in all your ways. Oh, so beautiful. You are beautiful in all your ways. Church, can we rise up together this morning to receive the ministry of an authentic prophet, Prophet David Wagner. Come on, you can do better than that. We welcome you into this place. Lord, we declare that, uh, Lord, there's nothing ordinary about today and there's nothing ordinary about you. That, Lord, you've come to do the extraordinary. You've come to walk and talk amongst us this morning. You've come to move in our midst. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying that I'm bringing you into a season that is beyond limitation. I'm lifting every lid. I'm opening every door. And everything that's tried to oppress you or hold you back, the Lord says that this is the season of the release and the revealing. For I'm about to reveal the sons and daughters of God to a world that's been waiting. And this is going to be a time and a moment where the Lord says that I caused there to be a turnaround moment in the earth. Where I'm going to cause the eyes of the church and the eyes of my people to fix their gaze upon me. For if you will turn your eyes and fix your eyes upon me, I will turn the hearts and the eyes of the world to see what you're looking at for this is going to be a season that is beyond normal and beyond usual for the Lord says that I'm expanding your expectation in the hour ahead for many have made yourselves too small and many have made me too small in your own eyes for the Lord says that I'm getting ready to come not as you want me to be not as the world has expected me to be but I am coming as I really am. And the Lord says that I'm about to make a triumphal entry 
into every defeated place. I'm about to make a triumphal entry into every place that seemed like it was lost or defeated. And I'm getting ready to release the rumblings and the winds of revival, not only in the church house, but in the schoolhouse. I'm about to come to release the rumblings and the winds of revival, not only in meetings, but actually in the streets and the restaurants and the shops. I'm getting ready to move in everyday life but the Lord says beyond what you've ever seen or known or heard before. For this is a season where I'm capturing and captivating my church once again. And I'm shaking off, I'm shaking off, I'm shaking off religiosity. I'm shaking off that which was formulas and principles without power. And the Lord says that I'm releasing you into a season that is unknown. It is unknown to you, but it is well known to me. For is it not written that uh, there is coming a day where eye has not seen and ear has not heard nor has entered the hearts of man all the things that God is preparing for those who love him and are called according to my purposes? Is it not a, a word for today and not just merely a word for the sweet by and by? For the Lord says that I'm about to do things you've never seen. I'm about to do things you've never heard. I'm about to do things you've never known. And the Lord says that this is a season of unveiling where I'm opening your eyes to see. For many of you have chosen to see dimly. You've been chosen to see through the fabric of a veil that's been torn. But the Lord says that I'm opening your eyes and I'm unveiling your eyes to, to see what has never been seen, to do what has never been done, to go where no one has ever gone before. So, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you. We receive your prophetic word. Lord, yes, it's sovereign. Yes, you'll do it. But, Lord, we, we receive the invitation to enter into it, to step into it. Lord, I thank you right now that, that Lord, you're about to do more in a moment than many of us thought we could do in a lifetime. You're about to do more in a moment than, than has been done in centuries. And, Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, there's an expectant hope Lord, there's an expectant hope. I feel the expectant hope of heaven in the room. I feel the expectant hope of heaven in the room. I, I don't know who needs to hear this, but some of you are waiting for God to do something to you, and God's waiting for you to do something to Him. Come on, I believe right now that there's a, there, there's a touching the hem of His garment moment in the room today. Lord, we reach up and we grab a hold of what you promised. We reach up and we grab a hold of what we have access to in this hour. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. If you believe the word of the Lord, will you give God a mighty shout of praise this morning? Come on, Jesus, you're worthy. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one but you. That, Lord, you are high and lifted up in Milton Keynes this morning. You are high and lifted up in this house this morning. You are high and lifting up in the UK this morning. And we know that if you would be high and lifted up, Lord, you would draw all men unto yourself. So, Lord, I thank you for the season of drawing and the season of your appearing. Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, you've come to walk and talk amongst us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what a great honor and privilege to be with you this morning. It's been an amazing uh, couple of days already. Uh, on a Thursday night, Apostle preached an amazing message. I believe he set the, the foundation for the whole weekend. And then yesterday, all day, uh, was amazing with William Wood. And uh, now you're stuck with me. Uh, and, and if you listen, if you don't like the way I preach, prophesy, uh, let's agree on one thing as we begin, all right? At least I'm easy on the eyes, right? The, the Lord did not send you an ugly American, right? He, he sent you somebody handsome and humble. Uh, and, and so, right? And, uh, but no, it's really great uh, to be with you. It's great to be in the house today. Uh, I believe the Lord is coming to do some things uh, and here's what I felt. There, there's a release of keys this morning where the Lord is actually unlocking something and unwake, uh, awakening something on the inside of you. Uh, I believe that there is a, a move of the Spirit of God that we are on the cusp of, that we're actually seeing the beginning 
waves of, and the Lord is, is wanting us to know and understand something, that, that the moment you've been waiting for isn't coming, but it's actually here. I shared this a little bit the other day with, with Apostle in the car, that the Lord's taking the church from the waiting room to the delivery room. There comes a day where the waiting is over and you actually receive and step into what you've been preparing for. I believe in the prophetic and in this season that we're in, if I could give you one word, uh, it would be this, prepare to accommodate. Preparation belongs to me, but accommodate, uh, but timing belongs to the Lord. And a lot of times we get frustrated in the waiting and we're not actually waiting on God. He's actually waiting for us to prepare for what he wants to bring to us. I have five children. We did not wait till we were on the way to the hospital to stop and get nappies, right? Or bottles or a crib or a bassinet. All those things were being prepared well in advance because we knew something was coming. It's one thing to prepare for what you've seen and what you've heard. It's another completely different thing to prepare for what you've never seen or heard. Are you hearing me? If you've seen it and you've heard it, you really don't have to prepare for it. But, but this is a season where the Lord's opening our eyes and opening our ears to prepare for what you haven't seen, haven't heard, what hasn't really even entered into your heart yet. There's something that the Lord is doing in our midst that, that is far beyond what we can see or comprehend. In, in 1 Kings chapter 17, I love this story of Elijah. Uh, Elijah goes to King, to King Ahab. Now, King Ahab is a wicked man. And to just give you an idea how wicked he is, he's actually married to Jezze. So, so he actually goes to sleep and wakes up every day with Jezebel, and she's meaner than him. And, and Ahab at, at, at Jezebel's uh, false prophecies and, 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 uh, and manipulation uh, starts doing things against God and against the people of God, and Elijah's had enough of it. It's interesting, if you read the scripture, you'll find this, that, that the Lord didn't tell Elijah to go to Ahab. The Bible says that Elijah went to Ahab and said, it's not going to rain and there's going to be no dew until I say so. He went to confront something because he knew what you don't confront becomes your culture. And the church has been great at comforting, but not great at confronting. And the Lord is releasing an anointing of kingdom confrontation upon our lives. It is not a confrontation of being mean or, 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 or harsh to people, but it's actually saying this is what's right, this is what's God, and this is what's not. See, I believe this, that the Lord is raising up prophetic people to be his spokesman, just like what we heard Apostle Daniel sharing with us. If you are the spokesperson, if you're the press secretary for the president of the United States or for the king or for the prime minister, you, if you're an ambassador to a nation, you, you get great privileges. Uh, uh, you get to live in nice accommodations. You uh, get to eat the king's food, drink the king's wine. You, you get all kinds of amazing uh, privileges that come with that office and that position. But in exchange, you give up one right. It's the right to your own opinion. Because opinions are like armpits. Everybody has to, and most of the time they stink. Right? So, so, so you give up the right to what you think what you perceive, what you want. So you will never hear the spokesman of a president, of a king, of a prime minister go, I think, I, my opinion is, but they always say that the policy of, the opinion of, the, the word of the king is this. And that's what the prophetic is. It, it's not dictating and saying things that I want, what I choose, what I prefer, but it's actually laying down your own preference and your own opinion to, 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 uh, to actually uh, calibrate yourself to what God is saying right here and right now. 
And so Elijah has this relationship with God. I don't think we understand it, but, but he, is, he has this anointing upon his life and this relationship with God that, that he knows what's in the heart of God and he knows when he opens his mouth that God will back up what he's saying. There's a mutual trust that Elijah trusts the Lord, but the Lord also trusts Elijah. And he goes, so it didn't say that, that the Lord told Elijah, go stand in front of Ahab and declare there's a drought coming. Elijah said, there's wickedness in the land. I'm about to confront it. And he says, there's not going to be rain or dew until I say so. Now, if I, I, I'm not as brave and bold as Elijah, I probably would have sent that in a text or a WhatsApp. I might have sent it in an email while I was already on a plane flying back to the States, right? Um, but, but he actually does it face to face. See, I believe there's a courage and a tenacity that's coming back to the body of Christ. But because we've become very passive in our faith. We've become very passive in our identity. We've become very passive to, and we've submitted to the world around us instead of actually ruling and reigning as God commanded us. Is this making sense to you? I believe right now the Lord is about to release a commissioning uh, upon us that, th that you can confront and confront in love and it will change the world around you. But what you don't confront becomes your culture and that explains a whole lot. Right? It, it looks like, can I tell you something? That the wickedness in the world is, is partially the fault of the church. Because we've tolerated what Jesus came to terminate. Don't tolerate what Jesus came to terminate. We tolerate foolishness. We, we tolerate sickness. We, we, we tolerate unrighteousness. We, we, we become tolerant. And, and what happens is this, is we keep building our tolerance up and up and up. And, and, and it's to the loss of righteousness. I love what Hebrews says. It says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. How do you get more boldness? Righteousness. The more I become righteous, not self-righteous, but the more I put on the righteousness of God in Christ, the more bold I can become because the enemy has nothing to say about me. There's no open door. There, there's no access point. And the Lord's about to release a boldness upon us that is connected to righteousness. And so Elijah comes and he confronts, there's going to be no rain, no dew unless I, until I say so. Notice this. So it happens just like Elijah said, and the Lord recognizes, hey, Elijah, I need to get you out of here. There's a bounty on your head. Ahab could cut your head off at any moment. But even more than that, you're about to actually, uh, you're, you're about to actually uh, undergo or actually walk uh, out this thing that you prophesied because you live in the land too. So the drought's actually going to affect you. What you prophesied is coming to pass, and not only for your own protection, but for, for your own provision in this moment, I need to move you. And the Bible says, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, depart from here and go by the, by the brook uh, Cherub, and I want you to stay there and I want you to drink from the brook. I want you to rest there and I'm going to command the ravens to feed you there. Now, how many know that's an unusual word? Uh, have, has anybody seen a bird of prey share their food with anybody? But there's a mutual trust that, that Elijah has with the Lord and the word of the Lord came to Elijah, but get this, then Elijah went according to the word. My friend, sometimes the word of the Lord comes to you, but then you've got to go to the word. Don't miss it. Sometimes the prophetic word comes to you, but then you've got to walk in accordance to what the prophetic word said. See, we can hear prophetic words like you've heard all week, like, like I spoke yesterday, like I spoke tonight or this morning. 
And you can go, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. God is sovereign. If God said it, uh, it it's going to happen. Uh, all of those things, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And the fact of the matter is, although I would agree with you on the sovereignty of God, that, that the Lord uh, is looking for people to partner with what he's saying. Is this making sense? Many of us are waiting for what we already have. We're, we're waiting for something to come upon us when the Lord's waiting for you to actually access to what's already on the inside of us. I believe right now that, that some of us are about to actually walk into the word that God said. So he's there, he's drinking from the brook. The, the ravens come and brings him food. They bring him meat, all of those things, and he's being sustained. But, but then all of a sudden, the brook dries up. Why? Because that wasn't the place of promise. That, that was the place to be sustained. It wasn't the place to prosper. It was the place to, to, of substance to be sustained. And if the brook wouldn't have dried up, Elijah would have never went to the next assignment. And it explains why many of us right now are in a season where, where we're standing in a moment. We're like, Lord, why, uh, is, why, is the, why is the joy lifting? Why in this moment are, are, am I noticing that, that provision seems to be drying up? It's because the Lord is about to transition you into something greater. And if you stayed in this place, drinking from that brook and waiting for the ravens to come and feed you, you will never step into destiny. I believe this. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that? You should believe it. It's Hebrews 13 and 8. It's the word of the Lord. But, but here's the thing about Jesus never changes, but he's always moving. That's why you're always in transition. Don't miss it. Jesus never changes, but he's always moving. Or in this Feast of Tabernacles moment. You, you know that when, when the, the people of Israel, were, they moved with the cloud. When the cloud stopped, they unpacked everything. They, 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 they set up the tabernacle just the way it was supposed to be. They, they set up their tents just the way it was supposed to be. And whether it was a day or six months or a year, they stayed there until the cloud moved. And every time they had to unpack everything. It wasn't like, oh man, we were only here a day last time. I don't want to go through that. Let's leave some things packed. They, they actually had to go through a process of unpacking everything until the cloud moved and then they moved again. And I'm telling you right now, the Lord is calling us back to that season of being people that, that move with the cloud of the glory of God, that, that know how to tabernacle with God in every different season, in every different place. There's something happening right now in this moment. See, can, I, can I tell you something? Don't try, to pre, don't try to process revelation rationally. Don't view what I'm saying to you as information. What the world has been on in the last three years is information overload. But you need revelation to set you free from information. Let that rest on you a moment. Some of you right now, it's explaining, I'm just explaining to you why, you're at, why you are walking through what you're walking through. You got to this place and everything looked good and everything was flowing good and everything, the, the water was good and the food was good and now everything that used to work isn't working. And it's not because God is changing or, or, or something is wrong with you. The Lord's actually transitioning you into a greater transformational moment. And he said, it's time to leave the brook. And I want you to go to the gate, Zarephath. The word of the Lord came to him and then he went to the word. And some of you right now, the, the Lord is waiting for us to move into that season that he's prepared for us by what he said for us. 
and, and, and we actually have to, to pick up and go there. Here, here's what I'm saying to, to us this morning. Has anybody ever been frustrated? Revelation without application leaves you in frustration. So you might have a revelation, but you don't know how to apply it to your life, and that's why you're staying frustrated. And you're frustrated with God, and you're frustrated with you, and you're frustrated with everything else because nothing's happening. And the fact of the matter is, God already spoke, and you've got to catch up to what he said. Have you ever got to a place where everything was flowing and going and growing, and it would seem just like you were moving towards the promise of God, and everything just went full on stop? Right? You, you, you went from, from full on, you know, just 150 miles an hour, just you're going to the promise of God, and then it was like you hit a wall. Can anybody relate to that? Here's what I've discovered, and most of us aren't going to want to hear this. Whenever, when something seems opposite of the promise, the first thing I do is I go to, back to my last place of disobedience and I repent pick up the promise, and I move through. Are you hearing me today? That, that there are certain things that you actually have to step into, uh, that, that you actually have to move towards. And, and I believe the Lord is bringing us into an amazing season. The word of the Lord's coming to you, but you're about to go to the word. I hope this is making sense. During worship today, as we're singing, we, we need to move, and all, all of those things. I heard the Lord just take me quickly to Revelation 2, verse 5. He said, I want you to repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. He, he's speaking to a church. He, he's, he's saying, hey, I need you to go back to do what you did at first. Do you remember when you first got saved? And you got so radically changed, you believe God for everything. When I first got saved, I remember my vehicle being on E. I had no money. And I would just pray, Lord, would you get me to the church? Will you get me to work? All of those things. And for a week, you would drive with no gas in your car because you trusted the Lord in all of it. You believe God for, for, for everything. And then somehow you tried to grow up and you forgot to grow down. And you've moved from childlike faith into doing things on your own. Can, can anybody relate to that? That, that? that I remember I would believe God for everything because he was everything. And then somehow we, we, we think we get so smart, we, we think that we get, well, we can figure it all out and, and begin to do things on our own. It's kind of like this. When, when I first got saved and, I, and I, I, under, I got the revelation about tithing and giving. And I was making just $200 a week and, and, and $20 seemed like it was all right to give, but I realized I didn't just want to make $200, I wanted to make $400, so I started tithing $40 instead of $20. My, my faith wasn't where I was, it was where I was going. And I wasn't to giving to get, I was just trusting the Lord. He said I could test him in this. Because I had faith to do that, and the Lord exploded. And then I remember when I wrote my first $100 check, man, that was something. Then the first $1,000 check, that was something. $10,000 check, that was something. And then all of a sudden you get to the $100,000 check and you go, do they really need my money? <laughs> because the more you have, there's something that shifts in our mind that makes us think that we did this and we got this. And, and, and if you don't do the things you did at first, you'll probably lose the things. Does this make sense to you? And the Lord's calling us back to the things we did at first. I remember I got radically saved. I was a, actually a schizophrenic an alcoholic, and I committed suicide. I attempted suicide 10 times. On the 10th time, I was successful. 
I took 250 prescription pills, a bottle of gin, a 12-pack of beer, and I laid down to die, or so I thought, on January 17, 1997. I ended up in a church 12 miles away from where I was living in front of the pastor. It was his first day out of seminary. Uh, he wasn't even the real pastor. He was just the interim pastor while they were waiting to vote in another pastor. Uh, and I dropped dead in his office, his first day out of job, on the job. Welcome to the ministry. Okay. I dropped dead in his office. He calls the ambulance. The ambulance comes. I'm dead, literally dead for three to five minutes. They come. They resuscitate me. They revive me. They bring me to hospital. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, they pump my stomach. And I'm on life support. I'm in a coma for two and a half days. And after two and a half days, through fingerprints, they figure out who I am and they call my mother in Chicago and they say, you might as well forget you ever had this son. He's not going to live, in it, but if he does live, uh, he'll be a vegetable the rest of the days of his life. He won't walk, he won't talk, he won't be able to feed himself. And my mom sat on the steps of her, of her house in Chicago, put the phone to her chest and said, Satan, you can't have my son. And God, I don't even know how you do what you do, but I'm asking that you make my son a miracle. I named him David because I always believed he'd be my little shepherd boy. I can't say at that very moment, but around that time, a bright light came into the room and Jesus revealed himself to me. And he said, son, I won't relent and I won't repent. I've not changed my mind about you. I've called you to go around the world preaching the gospel wherever you go, lives will be touched and changed. All I can tell you is I died crazy, but I woke up in my sound mind. I died empty, but I woke up hungry, and there's a huge difference. And, and all I can tell you is I felt peace and love for the first time, and my first prayer was not the sinner's prayer. I didn't know that one. I just prayed this prayer. God, if you can love me when I can't love myself, I'll serve you the rest of the days of my life. Uh, it's why I'm here in the room today. And, and the reason I'm sharing that is because there, there, there's these moments where God marks us, where God calls us, where, where, where God does the miraculous in our life and somehow we get caught up in the mundane and we forget the miraculous that he did to get our attention in the first place and the Lord is awakening us back to that place of first love to that place where he's calling us where, he, where, where he's bringing us in to, to something greater that we've never seen or known before here's what I'm saying is that I'm alive because of a miracle so why would I expect my life to be anything but miraculous? Can, can I tell you right now in this moment that God's salvation in your life is miraculous? So why would you expect your life to be anything but miraculous? there's a stirring up of faith in the room today. I would tell you that through the rest of the day today and tomorrow that the Lord's about to release the gift of faith in the room. It goes beyond the measure of faith that you get at salvation. It is, the, it is the, the ability to believe for what God is believing for. It is not your own faith. It's actually the faith not just in the Son of God, but it is the faith of the Son of God that comes into the room and it changes everything. And right now in this moment, the, the, the Lord is stirring that up afresh and anew on the inside of you, on, on the inside of me. And, and, and after I got, I got saved, the, the Lord spoke to me. I was actually in the mental hospital for four months. I was court ordered to be in there, so I had to go through electric shock therapy. I had to go through all kinds of medications. And every day they would gather me and they would say, uh, they would come to me. They would say, just own your disease. If you own your disease, we'll let you out. And I would say to them, I can't own it. Jesus took it. So they said, not only is he crazy, but now he's a fanatic. And here's what a, a, here's what a Jesus freak is, a Jesus fanatic is, somebody who loves him a little bit more than you do, Right? Uh, and, 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 and so I, I was frustrating them because I wouldn't own my disease because I couldn't own my disease because Jesus took it. On Good Friday of, of 1997, uh, they, they came to me and they said, own your disease, we'll let you out of here. I said, I can't own it, Jesus took it. They got together, they conferred, they got so frustrated, they said, Wagner, we want, to get you, we want you to get out of here and never come back. That was a really good Friday. <laughs> I 
I was so hungry for God that on Easter Sunday, I went to church eight times. I went to a sunrise service on Lake Michigan. By, by 8 o'clock, I was with the Lutherans. By 9.15, I was with the Dutch Reformed. By 10.30, I was with the Baptist. At 11.30, I was at a Lutheran Mass. Uh, I, at 12.30, 1 o'clock, I was at uh, a Spanish service. At the time, no habla espanol. <laughs> at at 2.30, I was at a, a Russian Orthodox service. I didn't speak Russian, nor was I Orthodox. Right? At, at four, I found a community church. Uh, at, at six o'clock, I, I found a, a charismatic church, but it wasn't very charismatic. Uh, and at seven, I went to a Pentecostal church. And by nine o'clock, I was still hungry. I went home, I turned on the TV. There was a, a guy preaching. Uh, he was from Texas. He had a globe spinning behind him. And he was preaching this message in this, in this Texas accent. How big is your want to? How big is your want to? How big is your want to? I didn't know what a want to was, but I wanted one. <laughs> did, did you ever hear preachers preach so good you have no idea what they're saying, but you're like, I want that. <laughs> That's what happened. And he started talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, if you want to just stretch your hands toward the TV. I, I took it a step further. I went up and touched the telly. And I got shocked. Wasn't the Holy Spirit at all, just static electricity in the room. I couldn't wait for Wednesday because Wednesday was the next day that God could show up. So I, I found myself in a Southern Baptist church uh, and I walked in, I said, Pastor, my name is David Wagner. I used to be alcoholic, schizophrenic. Uh, I committed suicide a few months ago. God raised me from the dead and now I'm here to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I thought Baptists were charismatics because they had drums and guitars. He was nice enough to tell me I wasn't going to get it there, but I could maybe go to the Pentecostals up the hill. And, and so I went up to the Pentecostals up the hill, and they tried to beat me over the head uh, with, a, with a King James Bible and put me through all kinds of formulas. And, right? and, and then I found this noon hour prayer meeting. And, and there was prayer Monday through Friday every day from noon to one. And you would pray corporately, and at the end, there was a ministry time, so I would go front, and they, they say, what do, you, what, what do you want? What do you want to receive? I said, I'm here to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I had one guy try to blow him into me. <laughs> I didn't get anything but garlic, cilantro, <laughs> onions, with a peppermint finish. Thank God for the peppermint finish. I had one guy try to rub him into me, but he couldn't get through the hairspray. I had one guy try to push him into me. I got knocked down, but I got up again. I wish I would have wrote a song about it in the 90s. I had one guy try to punch him into me. I punched the guy back. And after 30 days of spiritual abuse... I was driving down my car and I prayed this simple prayer. God, I want everything you have for me, even if I don't understand it. And he said, you'll never have to go through man to get what only I can give to you anyway. And, and he filled me with the Holy Spirit driving down the interstate and it changed everything. Here's the point. We're waiting for somebody when God's waiting on us. We're waiting on somebody to... to give to us what only God can give to us. We're waiting for somebody to activate in us what only God can activate in us. And, and I, I, I'm not underestimating the fact that we actually need people in our lives and we need pastors and leaders and prophets to come and give us words, all of those things. But, but I'm telling you that, that the Lord is saying to us today that the waiting is over because you already have what you need. Are you hearing me today? Does it make sense to you to wait for what you already have? The, the Lord is bringing us into a, a, a new season of understanding. Come back and do the things you did at first. He spoke to me, moved to Pensacola, Florida, a place I never heard of before. I moved there with a van that didn't have reverse and $141 in my pocket. I moved a thousand miles away on the word of the Lord. 
I think it was prophetic that my transmission was going out and I had no reverse. I couldn't go backwards. I could only go forwards. I, I get to Pensacola and I get lost, which is interesting because I didn't know where I was going anyway. I pull into a driveway. I open the, uh, the door of my car to, to push myself out. Uh, and, 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 and all of a sudden, this couple came out of the door named Dan and Carolyn Weaver, and they asked me if I was David Wagner. So I'm a 1,000 miles away from where I've left, and, and, and the Lord sets up the whole thing. My, my friends, these guys had been in uh, 1,000 miles away on a business trip. They walked into a Christian bookstore. My friend heard their funny southern accent, uh, asked them where they were from. They exchanged information, but it was before I had a page or a cell phone, an email, any of those things. And it's the driveway that the Lord causes me to go into. The, the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord, right? Man makes their plans, but God orders his steps. And I'm telling you, when God calls you to something, whatever God calls you to comes fully furnished. Every call of God on your life, everything that God's put in your heart to do, it comes fully furnished. He puts the right people in your path. He causes provision to come. He causes things to manifest for you. And, and I remember being there, and, and if that wasn't enough, like I was going to all of these revival meetings. I was watching the Lord move. I was just hungry, just day in and day out, going, going after the things of God because that was the, what was burning in my heart. And I remember a month in being there and finding myself being frustrated even as God's working the miraculous. Think about that for a moment. You could be in the middle of a move of God and still find yourself frustrated. And I remember telling the Lord, Lord, I, I, I want whatever you have for me. I, like, if you don't tell me where I'm supposed to be, then I'm going to go back. And he said, what are you going to go back to? See, there's always this tendency in our walk with God to go back instead of moving forward. I think that, that's why the greatest pastime of the church is the retreat instead of the advance. There's this tendency to always go back when the Lord says, I, I didn't call you backwards, I call you forwards. Is this making sense to you? And I said, exactly, what are you going to do? And he said, this is your year for Jubilee. I said, I don't even know what that means. He said, open the phone book. I open the phone book. There's Jubilee Church. I go there. I walk in. Uh, and, and immediately at the door, I get greeted by this couple named uh, Harold and Barbara Bowling. And, and they said, uh, what's your name? I said, David Wagner. And he said, you know, you got to call a God on your life. He's called you to go around the world, preaching the gospel, wherever your lives be touched and changed. Gives me the same word the Lord gave me when he woke me up. I go into the service, and uh, it is not my preference. I grew up very reformed, very, very traditional church. This church is loud. There's a guy in a three-piece suit and skateboard shoes, and he's got a guitar, and he jumps and spins off of the platform. There's, it's, they got a B3 organ. They've got all the instruments up there. It is super loud. I am overly stimulated. They have people with flags running around. I got hit in the eye with a flag. If you have flag ministry, please get healing ministry because flags hurt. I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the people sitting next to me, they break out their sack lunches. They have popcorn. I feel like I'm in a circus, not in a church service. They got the memo that this preacher preaches really long and like you're not going to get out of there until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The, the, the pastor pulls a whistle out of his pocket. He starts blowing the whistle. I said, why does he have a whistle? They said, because last week they took his tambourine. <laughs> I am overstimulated. I have no idea what's going on. The pastor stands up on a chair, blowing a whistle, waving a flag. And the Lord says, welcome home. And I said to the Lord, not my preference. And the Lord said, don't let your preference create a prejudice that keeps you from promise. Oh. 
Don't let your preference create a prejudice that keeps you from promise. There are things that we like. There are things that we prefer because they're comfortable to us. I preferred predictable church. But, but if you knew how it started and how it was going to end, why come at all? And all of a sudden, this man stands on the chair and he says these words, I can live without a lot of things, but I refuse to live without the presence of God. And when he said that, the Lord said, that's what you've been looking for your whole life. That man became my spiritual father. It's quite often that God will put people in your life that you don't even like. Because they have the keys to your destiny. They begin to provoke you to love and good works. Some of you right now, the Lord's about to move us from preference and prejudice into the place of promise. I was at that church for about a month. I remember on a Sunday night, church ended. I went to the grocery store. And as I went to the grocery store, I was, um, I had, I needed the gift of discernment. I'm in the soup aisle by the ramen. And I have to discern, do I want chicken? Shrimp? Hot and spicy or Beef? I'll never forget it. Barry Manilow is playing. Oh, man. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this bald-headed, four-foot, 11, missing a front tooth young man from Louisiana came running to me. His name was Shannon Abear. And you, I don't know if you ever saw Swamp People. But that's where he's from, okay? He's from the bayous of Louisiana. And he comes up to me, and, and I'm standing there just trying to figure out what soup I want. And he goes, hey, boy. If you need the translation, hey, boy. What God will call you a do? What has God called you to do? I said, I think I'm a pastor. He goes, oh, no, 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 boy. I guarantee you ain't no pastor. God called you to be a prophet to go around the world, preach the gospel wherever you go, lines of attention change. You're going to be a prophet to the nations. And then all of a sudden, he just starts going, shakaraba, kataraba, kataraba, shakaraba. Oh, man. <laughs> then he says, I guarantee, boy, God going to use you or raise the dead. And he walked away. I chose chicken. <laughs> I went home. I made the ramen. I sat at the table. I was getting ready to eat the ramen. I was praying. And I said, Lord, how is that? I mean, that's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. He said, not really. You've done a lot weirder stuff, and, and which was true. But, but in my Christian walk, this is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. I mean, one minute I'm listening to Barry Manilow trying to eat ramen. Next minute I got a Cajun guy coming up to me giving me a word about raising the dead. And I said, Lord, how is any of that going to happen anyway? He said, I need you to think like a normal Christian who has a word about raising the dead on your life. You'll never see dead people raised until you pray for dead people. So I read the obituaries. I had one suit. It was an olive green suit, polka dot tie, and I had pleather shoes, part plastic, part leather. <laughs> and the plastic had separated from the leather, so I prayed for the shoes, and they didn't come back together. I got super glue, gorilla glue, crazy glue, shoe glue, and none of it worked. 
So I got electrical, black electrical tape, and I taped them up, and I made them, and I shined them so they actually look like alligator or crocodile-looking shoes, okay? I thought I looked so fly, but my wife said, you didn't look fly, your suit attracted flies. And I thought she liked it until she told me we couldn't get married in it, and so, um, and, and so I just have this one olive green suit, okay? I read the obituaries, I go to the funeral homes, to, to, for, to wakes and funerals of people, I had no idea who they were. I go into the, I go into the receiving line, go, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. John was a good man. He loved you, Mary, with all his heart. Bubba, your daddy loved you. He loved going fishing with you and hunting with you. Jim Bob, your daddy loved you and so sorry for your loss. Then I would go to the casket. John, my name's David. And I'm here to get you out. <laughs> if you can hear me, John, open your eyes. I think he tried, but they were glued shut or something. So I put my hand in his cold hands. I said, John, if you can hear me, squeeze my finger. Don't pull it, John, squeeze it. In the name of Jesus, come up. And nothing happened. So I went to the next room. Mabel was in there. Oh, Mabel, she was a great woman. Man, she made beautiful, wonderful cakes. Member of the Bow Society for many years. We're going to miss Mabel. Mabel, my name's David and I'm here to get you out. In the name of Jesus, come up. And nothing happened. And I prayed for over 100 dead people in the funeral homes of Pensacola, Florida, and then I got caught. (coughs) One day I was walking in, and I was met by the funeral directors, by the morticians, and they said, we've been watching you. And there's no way you know every dead person in Pensacola. And they threatened me with a restraining order. So I said, Lord, what will I do? He said, you'll never see people raised from the dead until you see, until you pray for dead people. So I had to figure out where more dead people were. So I found out who was in charge of janitorial services and maintenance at the local hospital. I took him to lunch because the way to his heart and his keys were through his stomach. And I said, do you have keys that get you into everywhere in the hospital? He said, yeah, everywhere. I said, even the morgue? He said, are you some kind of freak? I said, no, I'm just a normal Christian who has a word about raising the dead on my life. And what's the worst that can happen? Your doctors practice medicine, they died. I want to practice raising the dead. What's the worst that can happen? They'll just stay dead. And he goes for it. He said, I'll get you in, but if you get caught, you don't know me. (laughs) And I prayed for 100 dead people in the morgues of Pensacola, Florida, and then I got caught. They threatened me with a restraining order. The only way I could get back in the hospital was if my wife was having a baby. That's why we have five. I mean, there's some biology involved as well, but. (laughs) And and so people ask me, David, did you ever get discouraged? And the answer, I could honestly look you in the face and tell you no. Because to me, it wasn't a matter of if it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when it was going to (laughs) happen. So the word comes to you, but you've got to go to the word. The word comes to you, but you've actually got to go to the word of the Lord and do what he says. See, there are many of us that are sitting on go. I I practiced, listen, doctors practice medicine, lawyers practice law. 
Why do they call it a medical practice or a law practice? Because they're practicing on you. If you go to the doctor with an infection and he gives you an antibiotic and after three or four days it doesn't work, you don't go on Facebook and Instagram and go, false doctor. (laughs) You just go back and say, hey doc, that didn't work, can you give me another antibiotic? Doctors practice medicine, lawyers practice law, you should be practicing in the Holy Spirit. You should be practicing in the gifts of God. You should be practicing in the gifts. You're welcome. (laughs) And so I'm practicing, but I don't see the results. I'm not discouraged and I'm not disappointed. Because I know in my heart that I've heard the voice of the Lord and it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Ten years later, in 2008, I'm flying to Uganda. I've been ministering out of New York City for uh, uh, about ten days. I'm already tired. I'm meeting a team of people in Amsterdam I'm exhausted when I get there. The only thing I want to do on the flight from Amsterdam to Entebbe is I want to go to sleep. But I have a team of people that have met me from around where uh, uh, William is from in Alabama. And these people are excited. Now they're Methodists and they're Baptists with a few, Cara, you know, Bapticostals and Carabaptists in there, okay? And, and, and some of them have great zeal bless their hearts. I'm just tired. And so I'm talking to them, greeting them. I have this plan. I'm just going to get on the plane. I'm going to get through the dinner service. I'm going to eat. I'm going to lean my chair back and I'm going to sleep, you know? And there's this girl. She's 18 years old on the trip. Her name is Christy. And Christy uh, has annoying faith. Ever meet people with annoying faith? Christy has annoying faith. And she comes up to me and goes, Brother Dave, because that's how they talk where William's from. Brother Dave, Brother Dave, Brother Dave, Brother Dave. <laughs> Brother Dave, what are you believing to see on this trip? I said, Christy, I'm believing to see the back of my eyelids. <laughs> she said, oh, silly Brother Dave, what, what are you believing to see on this trip? And I gave her just the preacher answer. I think I even went Pentecostal on her. Well, I'm believing for souls to be saved and lives to be changed and I'm believing for signs, wonders and miracles and healing of bodies, glory to God, hallelujah, good night, see you later, Christy. (laughs) She goes, silly brother Dave, you know what I'm believing to see? And I said, nope, but I bet you're gonna tell me. She said, I'm believing to see what has never been seen before. And something leapt up in my spirit that she was about to see it. Now, she saved up money. She worked part-time jobs through high school, and she saved up money for her own graduation gift, which she wanted when she graduated high school. She wanted to go on a missions trip to to Africa. We land in Entebbe. Uh, We're tired. We get off the plane. They say, you have to put on your suits because you have to look smart. I said, what do I look like? I'm dumb. I didn't understand the British whole thing of smart. And, and so we put on a suit, it's hot, it's like, you, you know, Africa hot, like 90 degrees and humid. Didn't matter if my suit was wrinkled because they fell out in the humidity. But we drive four hours out into the bush, there's 40,000 people uh, in a cow pasture, people, in, it looked like the New Testament, man, it was, it was amazing. We get there and Christy does what we tell her not to do. You know, we tell Christy, stay with the team, stay, you know, all, never walk away by yourself, just stay with us. And, you know, there's protocols and all of those things. But Christy sees a mama holding a baby, and she immediately goes into the sea of Ugandan people to go where this baby is. Now, she's not hard to find, blonde hair, blue eyes in Uganda, okay? So she, she's by this mama, and this mama hands her this baby. Now, this baby is the most deformed human being I've ever seen in my life. 
This baby is missing one complete eye, just has a socket, open socket. Blind in the other eye, just white eye. He is, is completely deaf. His jaw, bottom jaw is over here, top jaw here. He only has two teeth in the top, two teeth in the bottom, and they don't connect. He has two holes for a nose, but there's no, there's no nose there. He has club feet, club hands. And, and Christie's weeping over this baby, praying over this baby. And the first day, the Lord creates an eyeball where there was no eyeball and heals the other eye. A little while later, the Lord opens the baby's ears and he starts responding to sound. The next day, she prays for him again and the jaw aligns. The Lord grows a nose and he says, Jesus, <coughs> Jesus in his native language. He, he's, all of a sudden, she keeps praying and all of a sudden, the club hands and club feet just completely disappear. Now, I don't know about you, but I had never seen that before. Notice what I said. There, there was an 18-year-old girl on the trip. She believed God to see what has never been seen before. See, some of you are waiting for the next major apostle or prophet or pastor or teacher or evangelist to come and lay hands on you or, or, or to maybe lead you into some sort of... And God's actually just waiting for you to realize that you were created to do the works of God. This was not miracles performed through famous, charismatic, Pentecostal leaders. This miracle was performed through the hands of a little girl who dared to believe God to see what had never been seen before. That kind of faith is coming to the UK. That kind of faith is dropping in this room today. That kind of faith is what the Lord is about to fill you up with in the hour in which we live in. Are you hearing me today? Four days into the meeting, this mama comes walking from the Congo border carrying a baby with cerebral malaria. As she's walking with this baby towards us, uh, uh, she's, she's on a two and a half day, three day journey and six hours into her trip, the baby dies in her arms. She has to make up her mind, do I bury the baby here? Do I go back to my village and bury the baby there or do I keep on coming? And she keeps on coming and she walks with a dead baby for over two and a half days. Buzzards are flying. You can imagine rigor mortis setting in, the flesh beginning to rot. And she keeps coming. She gets to where we are. The clinic is closed because now we're doing the night meetings. And she tries to come up on the platform, but there's guards there and they're trying to push her away. But she takes the dead baby's feet and she starts just knocking the, the men out of the way. They move pretty fast. She comes and she lays the baby at my feet. There's a Baptist pastor on my right, a Methodist pastor on my left. It was not time for a theological dispensational discussion. She just said, my baby's dead. What is your God going to do about it? We said, what's his name? She said, Samuel. We said, Samuel, in the name of Jesus, we call your spirit back into your body. You'll live and not die. You'll prophesy to clear the word of the Lord. All of a sudden, his rigor mortis body went limp. All of the open uh, flesh began to close up. He, he began to cough and sneeze. He sat up. We gave him some, we, some water and some matoki. And two and a half hours later, while we were preaching, he was playing soccer. He was playing football behind the platform because our God is the God who raises the dead. And I'm telling you right now that there is a moment in God in this room this morning that many of you are about to see the Lord about to awaken faith on the inside of you again to believe for what you've never seen before. Repent and do the things you used to do at first. When you trusted God for everything, when you had a hangnail, you trusted the Lord. When you stubbed your toe, you trusted the Lord. When your husband went crazy, you trusted the Lord. When your wife wanted to leave you, you trusted the Lord. When your bank account went empty, you trusted the Lord. When the gas tank was empty, you trusted the Lord. And the Lord's calling us back. It is first love, but it is also first things. 
I had to wait 10 years to see it come to pass. Galatians 6 and 8 says, do not be weary in well-doing. For in due season you'll reap if you faint not. William said something amazing right before pastor came up and invited people forward last night. He said, God can use a failure, but he can't use a quitter. I was up half the night just thinking about that. Because the only way you don't win is if you quit. And there are some of us in this room today that, that are basing our theology on what we haven't seen. People have created doctrines of disappointment. Because if I don't believe, I won't be disappointed. And the Lord's coming to set us free from all of that today. Are you hearing me? Well, Dave, that's Africa. I know there's a lot of people that have, have Africa roots here. But you're about to see it in the UK. Amen. Come on. I have a friend. His name is David Campbell. David Campbell was telling me a story of, of, of somebody in his family that's a paramedic in London. And she was being trained and she had the most senior uh, EMT, the most senior paramedic training her. She was in her last week of training. They get a phone call or a, a call, ambulance call uh, to an apartment building in London and this lady had fallen and had a compound fracture where the bone broke outside of the skin, broke the skin, the femur broke the skin. She was bleeding. They, uh, a lady, a believer, neighbor next door from Nigeria came and was praying for her until the ambulance came. They tied on a tourniquet. They got her on the stretcher. They brought her down the stairs. They got her into the ambulance. Uh, and as they're driving to hospital, uh, as they're driving to the A&E, um, about three minutes out from the a &E, they, they're calling in, they're getting the surgical theater already prepared, and all of those things getting ready to run her in. And in the ambulance, all of a sudden, the bone comes back in, come the muscle and the skin come back in, the bleeding stops. And now the two paramedics are going, what are we going to tell them? We've already prepared them, all of those things. Uh, and so they, they, they don't know what to say. And they get to the hospital and the lady's leg there said, listen, when we got there, the bone was outside of the body. She was bleeding out. We put a tourniquet on. And somehow when we were driving from the, uh, about three minutes out, the bone came back together and the flesh came over it and the bleeding stopped. And we don't know what to, how to describe it. And the doctor said, it happens sometimes. <laughs> he, he didn't have the vernacular. He didn't have the vocabulary for miracles. So he just said, it happens sometimes. I'm telling you right now, those things are about to happen all over London, all over, uh, all over Milton Keynes, all over this area and all over this region. That, 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 that he's, not, he, he's not just the God who performs miracles in third world countries. But he walks in palatial places. He, he walks in, in first world nations. He, he knows how to turn the hearts of kings. Are you hearing me today? Well, Dave, are you just telling us stories or you're prophesying? Yes. Revelation 19 and 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So if you can testify, you can prophesy. The stories that you've heard yesterday and today are, are not to go, wow, look at these amazing men of God. These stories are to provoke you to realize that if God could use us, God can use you. And I'm telling you right now that there's a Holy Spirit provocation coming for us to believe God, not just on Sunday mornings or in conferences, but to believe God to, to perform his mighty works and his mighty deeds in our midst today. Okay, are you hearing me today? Here, here's what I felt. Many of you have words over your life. The word came to you. Now you gotta go to the word. Some of you have taken the posture of waiting 
And now God's calling you into the posture of walking. <clears throat> of walking it out. Some of us right now in this moment, the Lord's calling you back to first love and first things. If I'm talking to you, I want you to stand to your feet. Say, David, I, I started trusting in myself. I started trusting in my intellect. I started trusting in my job. I started trusting in my own giftings. I started all of those things. The Lord's bringing us into that place of doing things we did at first. Holy Spirit, right now, would you move in our midst? Move in our midst. Move in our midst. The call on your life, son. It's so profound, so beautiful, so wonderful. The Lord's giving you broad shoulders, but an even bigger heart. If I were going to name the ministry the Lord was given to you, it'd be hearts on fire. The Lord's called you to, to create a company of burning hearts. Smith Wigglesworth and other amazing men around England and around the world, they would greet each other and they would say, are you burning? In every correspondence, they would sign their letters, KOF, keep on fire. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to raise up burning hearts that will release turning hearts to nations. There's a deep healing taking place on the inside of you. Every place where you weren't affirmed. Every place that you weren't believed in. The Lord's saying, son, I believe in you. I don't know what this fully means, but I heard the Lord say, the season of self-punishment is over. Like you have grace and mercy for everybody else except for you. And I'm telling you right now, the grace and the mercy of God is about to, is about to spill over on you. And I felt like the Lord right now There's a fresh anointing dropping in the room. I feel like there's some people in the room, you stopped praying for the sick because you didn't see anything happen. And disappointment settled in. There was an old prophet in our city back in Pensacola. Somewhere he got mad at God and out at the church and he decided to just drive a school bus it doesn't seem very smart to me but uh, he just drives a school bus he wanders into a meeting I'm doing with some other people one night and another older prophet recognizes him and wants to acknowledge him and affirm him and thank him for how he pioneered so he brings him up onto the stage onto the platform and he said brother you want to share a word he said I don't do that anymore so you sure there's something on the inside you want to share? He said, I don't do that anymore. And we all began to lay our hands on him and all of a sudden he just began to go, oh my God, I feel it again. 
my God, I feel it again. And he began to prophesy. And what I feel like the Lord is saying in this moment is some of you, you're about to feel it again. The Lord's about to release that fresh anointing on the inside of you where you're about to feel it again. Holy Spirit, right now, would you activate, would you move, would you stir up every good and perfect gift on the inside of your people? Afresh and anew tonight. Afresh and anew this morning. In Jesus' name. The Lord's anointing you, honey, for healing ministry. Lord, right now, I release the anointing of healing to flow through her hands. You're going to teach on healing. You're going to eat, sleep, talk it. Like everywhere you go, you're going to notice everything about healing. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, would I release that anointing, that grace for healing ministry. Lord, I thank you for her strong voice. That, Lord, you're about to release a voice on the inside of her that's going to wake people up. You live in that tension between comforting and con confronting. There's going to be days where you just confront people in love. But I'm telling you right now, whenever Jesus was moved with great compassion, all were healed. And all that were oppressed of the enemy went free. Lord, right now, I release that healing anointing. I release that healing gift, that healing grace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Honey, I saw the Lord releasing keys into your hands today, and the Lord said, I've anointed you to unlock people's hearts and destinies. And I saw the grace of God upon your life to see people set free and healed of all kinds of oppression and depression. And I felt like the Lord said that this is a season uh, where he just showed me uh, Psalm chapter 8, verse 5 says, You are created just a little bit lower than the angels. And God has crowned you with glory and with honor. And I felt like the Lord said that he's getting ready to use you to minister to people who don't have any idea where they are or how they got here. I don't know how to explain it, but I, I saw people coming from other places that they were just trying to escape. They're trying to escape war or warfare. They're trying to escape poverty or different things. I don't know anything about you, honey, but I heard the Lord say that he's making you a woman of refuge. I felt like the Lord said that, that, that he's going to use you in mercy gifts. And I felt like the Lord said that he's about to bring people even that you've been praying for to you. I feel like the Lord's given you a big heart for people that have been torn apart. He's given you a big heart for those that have even been displaced. And I just felt like the Lord said that like, you've been crying out, Lord, if I just had the place, if I just had the rooms, if I just had the... And I'm just telling you right now, the Lord's about to revive for what he's called you to. But Lord, I thank you right now, Lord, for her heart. I'll just say it. I feel like the Lord's given you a heart for Eastern Europe and given you a heart for people like in the Ukraine area and, the, and those things. And I just felt like the Lord said that, that he's about to use you to rescue people. Now, I feel like I know the stuff that's going on there, but I also feel like the Lord's going to use you to rescue people that have been trafficked. I saw you ministering to people that have been trafficked, taken advantage of. Lord, I thank you right now for that anointing to rescue Lord, I thank you for anointing her to, 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 to use her to, to, being, to bring refuge, Lord, to people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The Lord's about to heal your dreams. He's about to heal and restore your dreams. Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, she's not going to fear the night. She's not going to fear the dark. Lord, I release healing into every trauma. Lord, right now, in Jesus' name.
telling you, the, the, the light of the glory of the Lord is about to rest upon you. The Lord's about to shine the brightest light even to, into what you feel is a night season of your life. Holy Spirit, would you just move with power and might on the inside of her today? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I, I felt like this. Maybe you need to pray like that 18-year-old girl Christy prayed. Lord, I want to see what's never been seen before. I feel that childlike, yet gift of faith dropping in the room today. Somebody needs to hear this. It can happen here. It will happen here. Lord, right now, <clears throat> Apostle, Pastor, you're raising up kingdom pioneers. It's the church of the pioneers. Not redoing, not rebranding, not recreating what's been done, but pioneering into the great unknown. There's a reason I called you back. There's a reason I brought you back. I had great need of you. In a land of many teachers, I needed a father. In a place of many well-known preachers, I needed a father. Son, this is going to be a year where you break through every barrier. You're about to break through the number barrier. I'm giving you the faith to surpass 500 and then 5,000. For you've realized that it's not about numbers. It's about names. This road has been lonely, but it's about to get lively. This path has been hard, but it's about to become fruitful. And the Lord says to the two of you, you're about to step into the, one of the most fruitful years of ministry you've ever had. I'm going to send you reinforcements. I was thinking about this this morning. The UK used to send missionaries all over the world. America sent missionaries all over the world. Europe sent missionaries all over the world. And now the Lord's sending missionaries back to the UK. They're coming from Nigeria. They're coming from South Africa. They're coming from the Americas. They're coming from Asia. The Lord says, I'm releasing the anointing of buildings and lands. It's not just a building. It's not just a land, but buildings and lands. Out of the house, you'll build a school. And out of the school, you'll build a Bible college. heard the Lord say you know that you can make five phone calls and make something happen 
but you've chosen not to make the phone calls. Because your hope was not in a man. You put your faith in the Lord. I'm demonstrating something for you, for your children and your children's children. (laughs) Your children and your grandchildren and their children will talk about, I remember when. The Lord provided this and the Lord built this. Lord, I thank you right now. Lord, I thank you for moving them into the year of the phenomenon. Beyond their wildest dreams and expectations. It's a season of roots and wings. It's a season of roots and wings. Planting and soaring. will be the year of the government of God. But the fatherhood and the the government of God coming upon the two of you. Lord, right now, I heard the Lord say it's going to take you six months. Woman of God, it's going to take you six months to even talk about what's happening in you this week. You're fully here, you're fully present, but the Lord also has you elsewhere. It's a season of being caught up in God. Where's Pastor Ruth? She's caught up again. Where's Pastor Ruth? She's lost in the glory again. Lord, right now, I thank you for her gift to articulate things in English that have only been spoken in the spirit. There's an invitation to communicate what's only been spoken in the spirit. I don't know who it was. Somebody wrote a book about translating God. Lord, I thank you right now. In Jesus' name. Lord, I release that gift of faith connected to the prophetic word. Lord, that blind eyes are about to be opened. Body parts are about to be recreated. The dead are about to be raised. Lord, thank you for demonstrating your power and your mind in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just appreciate God and appreciate the talk of the Lord? So we're going to have a lunch break until 2 p.m. 2 p.m. is going to be our next session. And um, just wanted to remind you of two things very quickly. I think most of us here are part of the KFMI family. And those who are not yet part of the KFMI family and the Lord's going to be stirring your heart, um, it's a good thing to hear. One is that the Spirit of the Lord reminded me approximately eight or nine years ago, nine years, I came into this building 
with shortly just been brought into Milton Keynes and I was still kicking and screaming and still telling the Lord I wanted to be back in America. And I remember I came into the service of the New Life Church and I was sitting somewhere at the back there and I was asking God this question, my son next to me, why are we here? Why Milton Keynes? Why another church? What for? What difference is it going to make? There, this church is here already. And I remember one of the things that the Lord said to me very clearly that is supposed to be the unique distinction of KFMI. He said, we are to be known as a church that demonstrates the kingdom with signs and with wonders. And he said, aim and press in for the time when you will be known. I mean, churches all over the world have some goals that are primary goals. But with each apostolic center, with each one that the Lord establishes, there will be some areas of focus. And I remember very clearly the Lord said, you're going to press in to be a church that knows how to cultivate my presence, that my presence would come down and there will be manifestations of my power. And that the day would come when people want to say, when they want to talk about kingdom faith, it will be like, you know, that place where you know you can get healed. That place where you know the power of God will be demonstrated. That place where miracles will take place. And I said this just for you to connect with the word of the prophet. I heard it when you said, gift of faith will be released. And now I understand why I couldn't get off the platform until I started singing, may we never lose our wonder wide-eyed mystified because in kingdom faith we've seen a lot of things and it's really interesting my wife and i were having a conversation this weekend that people who've come around us and walked away from us because they've seen they got kind of close and saw the man and didn't see the purpose and they've just walked away like well there's no big deal i can i can do without this relationship um and there are people who know who know about kingdom faith they know where we are but they they don't come I mean, sometimes we, we go the extra mile. She was telling me even this morning, I didn't know that she was doing the same thing as I was doing. I was going out of my way in the last three days, just inviting a whole bunch of people who I know can't discern our difference. And from time to time, I've learned that lesson of, hey, you don't need to try and attract everybody, just the people who can discern your difference. But I want those of you who are here to hear the word of the prophet. When the word is declared we're going to have to step to it we're going to have to grow up to it we're going to have to go for that word we're going to have to reach out for that word the spirit of the lord told me he said quickly go again and check that word wait when it says to wait upon the lord cover the word he said and i now looked and i noticed that one of the meanings of that word is to look for to wait on the Lord is not to just stay in one position and say, I'm waiting for God, but it's also to look for, meaning we're going to have to come to it. We're going to have to go for it. We're going to have to press into it so that we can see it manifest. The second thing I want to remind you of very quickly is I got a word from just one of the sons in the house. And I'm just going to read one phrase of it. During this conference, people you would not expect will be given unusual gifts. Expect the unexpected. And it came back to me again, just as you were rounding up, that, you see, sometimes within the body, some people would want to show themselves to be somebody, to be something. And if they don't get that acknowledgement, they get upset. But they don't understand that God does not choose that way. It's like God coming into the house of Jesse, and seeing all the Eliabs and all of them and all those who want to pick themselves up and let everybody know that I'm somebody, I'm very spiritual, I, I can see, I can pray, I can do all of that. And God can bypass all of that and release his hand upon the least likely, the one that you don't expect. Oh my God. Mario, if you have an idea of what the Lord is doing with you in this couple of days i saw it yesterday and the prophet confirmed it people are going to be shocked because we've been seen wrongly and 
we sometimes just shove some people aside because if we think they're nothing or they're nobody, we'll be shocked at what the Lord will do because he's the only one who sees the heart. Everybody looked at the outward appearance of all of the sons of Jesse, but God was the only one who saw the heart of the one that some people think, oh, there's nothing to this one. I can shove him to one side. I can just talk to him anyhow. And so I just want to encourage you one more time. Please be back this afternoon at 2 p.m. Don't miss your moment. For example, I can tell you 2 p.m. is going to be going to be wild i can just tell you it's going to be wild this afternoon it's going to be wild whatever you do don't miss it if anybody calls you and try to engage you with some other activity tell them not today not today family brother sister who mom dad you know the way jesus they told him your mom and your brothers and they said what he said who who is my Who's my mom? Who's my brother? Because, you know, we miss it sometimes. We don't understand that the enemy knows how to move you away to miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. Be back at 2 o'clock. God bless you.